Good morning and welcome to another jump recruitment discussion. By the numbers of people who've signed up, it's obviously a very, very hot topic. And I think I can safely say that almost 100% of the clients that we have been seeing, this is their number one issue at the moment. So as people join the webinar, as always, if you could put a nice hearty hello in the chat box so you can ensure that we can hear you, it'd be much appreciated. If we start to think, we go back after the, an extraordinary year in the UK employment landscape in 2020, the UK has now entered what we would class as the most chronic skill shortage in the labour market has ever seen. With the pandemic raging, or yo-yoing up and down, depending on who you're talking to at the time, okay, the change in the UK economic status due to Brexit, this has created what we would call the biggest opportunity for us as recruiters however we still have the big problem of candidate attraction surprisingly though according to the open university barometer during the year financial year 1919-20 businesses spent 1.6 billion on plugging short-term skills gaps compared to 4.4 billion the previous year year financial year 2021 they're expecting more money to go into that plugging the short still uh, short term skills gap, but they're also expecting a huge amount of money to be pumped back into full time employment. The skill shortage bludging from the Department of Education and what the data from the REC has started to show is that the most people are now using pre COVID figures as a benchmark to show the changes in the labour market from the top to bottom and the pressure that is provided in every sector for headcount as we exit and the cover recovery gathers pace and employers look to seek an advantage. The survey showed consistently a fall in recruitment growing skills deficiency in the middle and high skilled roles and poor investment in skilled development positions over the last decade is actually at the heart of the issue and when you put the pandemic on top of that we actually have created the perfect storm so today's topic of candidate attraction and where we look to build develop and monetize our candidates is now the key and the number one objective of most recruitment agencies so today I'm joined by Heather, Paul and Dave. Mr. Sharp is on assignment. So if you want to ask questions, please ask questions as we get along. As usual, it's a 45 minute webinar, but I can tell you it's going to go as quickly as any available candidate is on the marketplace. <laughs> so I don't think there's much to learn, but I think it's about unconnecting the old dots and reconnecting new dots. So it's about changing not old habits, but adding new habits to those habits to create a better candidate database. So let's kick off. The question that we always think about is, do you reinvent the recruitment process every time you take on a renew requirement or are you doing something different? Guys, from our experience of dealing with clients okay, and recruitment agencies, what's our experience of that at this moment in time? Heather, you kicking off or do you want me to kick off? Oh, Heather, kick Heather's off. already said that she does not want to kick off. Paul. I'll kick it off. Yeah, okay. So, so I, think, I think one of the very frustrating things uh, for recruitment business owners is that too often, and maybe this was perhaps more evident pre COVID than post COVID, too often when their business took on a new role, the first knee jerk reaction was to place the role on a job board or you know, advertise it on social media. And the very last place that anybody bothered to consider was the candidate database, the CRM system, uh, because there seems to be either a complete lack of trust in the CRM system or that people feel that the information is inaccurate and so on. I mean, I, I've yet to meet a recruitment business owner or indeed the staff that believe they have a brilliant CRM system when the reality is most, if not all, of the CRS, CRM systems to a greater or lesser degree are perfectly acceptable. It is that user error thing, you know, rubbish in, rubbish out, basically. So, you know, I would say unquestionably is we're now emerging from the COVID situation, hopefully very quickly now. We certainly think things go back to whatever normal looks like in about three and a half weeks. Um, we should all consider how we utilize our candidate database above 
using other methods to recruit staff. And I think that is what we will want to talk about during the next 45 minutes to a large degree. So what we're talking about there is that change of habits, Paul, whether we're talking ribo, rubbish in, rubbish out, or gigo, garbage in, garbage out, as the tech, tech, tech guys call it. What we're saying is it's about changing the habit. If the habit is initially to go de facto job board and then the last thing is your CRM, what we're talking about is actually changing the habit and looking at how we can develop a better CRM experience for our consultants that provide quicker candidates to you rather than just going to facto, let's find a candidate on a job board. I, I, would yeah, and I think sorry Heather go on you first what I was going to say is Paul Sharp's not on today but I know that he showed us some data last week that showed job boards are declining in their effectiveness um, and so there is a real yep. imperative about looking at alternatives to job boards they are not the solution uh, to our candidate shortage so if anybody wants to have a look at the data that Paul, uh, Paul produced let us know and we can yeah pop some data over to you but they're you know to convince your recruiters that they need to change job boards are declining in their effect absolutely look guys how often have you had this similar conversation the one i've had on numerous occasions where i've been i've talked to clients and they've done an analysis of their placements in the previous three months 12 months and they've said something like the following guess what um 80 of the candidates uh, we placed last year came from job boards and then they follow that with and guess what 70 odd percent of those candidates were already registered on our CRM. I, I, I'm, I've had that conversation more times than I care to mention. Um, so we are spending money over and over again to get the same candidates we already have details of. So why is it that we continue to do these things? And I believe very strongly, I know you guys agree with this, that the CRM system, the if it's a clean, up-to-date, database is an incredibly valuable asset in the truest sense. I mean, on a P&L, on a balance sheet, an asset of a recruitment business. It isn't just an admin task. It actually adds value when the business gets sold. If we looked at that, though, in real terms, though, Paul, and we genuinely looked at that in real terms, and we look at that as an asset, if we said you had even, I don't know, 50,000 people on your database, and that's a reasonable size database. Let's drop that down to 20,000 people on a database. And you said your average fee is four, four grand. That's an 80 million pound worth of database. Yeah. Let's divide that by, yeah, let's times that by, let's just say, put it 10%. That's still 8 million worth of there, just utilizing 10% of your data. So there's a massive opportunity to say, you know, what are we doing? And this is the way we start to think about absolutely capitalizing on the data that we have, and that's the candidates that we have in our database and how we monetize them. So the next question that we talked about is, do we influence the active, passive and hidden candidate marketplace that is either on our database or out there in the ether waiting to be found and discovered? So kind of linking to that is something that Paul said about having a clean and up-to-date database. I find that when I talk to recruitment leaders, most of the time when they're walking on the floor or they're talking with their consultants, just in general chat, they're not particularly happy with their database. And the message that they're giving is our database isn't very good. And because they're giving that message and that just seeps into the consultants at the desk, it's almost giving the consultants an excuse to go elsewhere. And it's almost, there almost needs to be in some cases, not in every company, but there almost needs to be a pause where we do invest time in the people that we're connecting with, that we're networking with on LinkedIn, on social media, and putting those and making sure that they're up to date on our database. Mm because you're absolutely right. The value to our businesses of our database is enormous. You know, I've used the phrase that uh, old Mike Gordon used to use for, for me, was let the data decide. Um, I, I've, I've been, been in a company where commission wasn't paid if the consultant placed somebody from a job board that was then found to be on the database. <laughs> and let me tell you, that behavior change <laughs> made a world of difference that over a three-month period, people suddenly updated the database. 
Well, also, by the way, people left because they didn't like that rule. <laughs> yeah. 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 I can imagine good. that going down like a lead balloon. Well, right? well, <laughs> I, can, I can see people rolling their eyes, even from where yeah. I'm sitting. Yeah. So it, it wasn't a great panacea, but it was the fact that we needed to make a change. We needed a change of behavior, and that had to come from the top because there isn't a database, there isn't a CRM out there that's perfect. They all say that they are, but the reality is they're not. It's how you use them, it's why you use them and what you use them for. Uh, I, as well. I couldn't agree more with you. I mean, just uh, before we came on to the webinar, we were comparing stories about this point you made, Dave, and I was talking about my, my early years at Alfred Marks, and if at the end of the, the month they were getting tight to the line on target, there'd be an edict that said we could no longer for that week or two weeks advertise in the evening standard, the evening news, Girl About Town, Miss London magazines, which was our only outlet to find new candidates, apart from people wandering in through the door. We had to go into our rotodexes to find candidates. So they switched <laughs> off They switched off the ad spend. Guess what? Didn't have any impact at all, negative impact at all on placements. We just had to start <laughs> contacting people in our files, or as we used to call them, the dead files, you know? So. <laughs> Um, this is so, what Paul, yeah, Paul, Paul, the, an Paul, the anecdote Paul, that... Then, then Queen Victoria died, Paul. And then, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad, Dave, you've taken over the Paul Sharp, get the oldie jokes in. I think what Fodge files, saying, absolute fodge files. I, I would just yeah, add, yeah, add, add a job. similar, <laughs> yeah, similar exactly. anecdote. A similar anecdote to that was an <laughs> organisation that swapped from one database to another so changed their CRM wanted something a bit more modern and sophisticated but actually didn't move any of the data from the old one to the new one so they started with a fresh clean empty database much to the consternation of many recruitment consultants in the organization but actually that 12 months following that they had the best the best 12 months um, of their existence because of the work that was done on getting the database live current up to date um, and valuable. So, uh, you know, go, it's without question. It's Let me give you two, two sides of that on the active, passive and hidden candidate marketplace. So I, I took over a company for a while and they were spending around about half a million pounds constantly on advertising jobs. And it was the candidate, the consultants demanding more jobs, more jobs, more jobs. And the MD was a little bit weak and he would give them more and more jobs. And he was giving loads and loads of jobs out, etc. So when I walked through the door, I banned all advertising. It had no impact other than increases the number of requirements we made because it made people actually go in and use the candidate database and find candidates that we already knew and had and therefore we were quicker to the market and faster to the market Anne's asked a really interesting question can i throw something in here that we agree that on the perm side uh, that that is we need to be growing a candidate marketplace but on the temp side it's so frantic unless we offer jobs to new temps before they leave the office they won't be available the day after the days of having temp candidates in the drawer and waiting for work is no longer a luxury yeah. well, i go back to my sort of early early 90s where again there was no internet and you know you advertise your contract jobs on the thursday and they would then be put in freelance informer and it would come out the following thursday so in a week before the advert came out so we weren't really bothered about advertising the job. We actually networked our marketplace constantly. And what Anne's talking about, if I found a candidate, it's where could I place that candidate? And it was the rush to place yeah. the candidate once yeah. I found someone who was available. Yeah. But what we were doing is we were building a candidate database before our client came to us with a requirement. For some reason, we flipped that. We only start to look for a candidate now when our client gives us the requirement. And that is where the bottleneck to me has started to be created because we're reinventing that wheel every day rather than thinking, right, I've got a load of clients with this type of skill set. Why not have I got somebody in my office who's just trying to find candidates, whether they're available or not at that moment in time, they will be available at some point of time in the contract or temp market because they'll have finished an assignment and it's whether you're keeping in track of that candidate to ensure that you can place them. So tracking your candidates that are on the passive, active and hidden marketplace yep. are really important because yep. then you can start to place them. So unless you're tracking them, you don't know. Unless you're filling out your database properly with what their end dates are so you can pull them up on a search, on a marketing email, etc., you don't know. So it's all about using the data that you have, marketing it and learning to harvest properly rather than just reinventing the wheel 
every morning the new job comes in, I need candidates like this, I need yeah. candidates like this. Yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, Howard, I'm just picking up on Anne's point as well here. You know, we there are a number of people exchanging messages that, like me, go back uh, a number of years to sort of old-style recruitment methods. But you know something? Those old-style recruitment methods have sustained, and there's a reason for that. They work. We were taught to place great candidates in great jobs, not fill jobs. I grew up in a candidate short market. Guess what market we're in now? And when you find a, as Anne correctly says, you find a an available temporary worker or indeed a really good quality permanent candidate, you don't let them leave your office in inverted commas, whatever that looks like these days, until you've set you've started to market them out. That's all I did all day long. I was I phoned in my day clients to offer them, offer them in bold letters candidates that I had sitting next to me in my office. And the golden rule was, and lots of people remember this, you had to make 10 calls and you had to try to get each candidate that was available three interviews on perms or an assignment on temps before they left your office. For precisely the reason Anne mentions, that if you didn't act immediately, by the time you phoned them the following day, they already had interviews lined up, they already had an assignment. Well, you know, folks, this is where we're at now. And this candidate short market that we are in is going to get more and more short of candidates. Not, it's not going to change anytime soon. We're talking to clients uh, over the last several weeks, some of them involved in areas like hospitality, and there is a major issue around candidate shortage, which is linked to the Brexit situation. Those problems are not going to be solved in, in, in the next few weeks. So we, our people need to get used to understanding how to find candidates, and then when they get them, to your point, Howard, track them, make sure you keep close to them and get them work consistently, not just the once, but consistently. So to give you an idea on what some of the big players are doing on that, I was working with one of the big players in the in the financial marketplace, and four and a half, five years ago, they changed their whole system, so everybody had a laptop or a Surface Pro, whatever it was, to go out to the marketplace. And their idea was both on the temp and contract market, if you were going out visiting clients and they were targeted on visiting clients, a number of visits every single day, Mm -hmm. if you were talking to that client about a job, that you should already have three to four candidates already prepped that would be available for an interview immediately because their idea was they wanted to log straight onto the client's wi-fi use video technology to then have an instant video call with a candidate if the client said they had a requirement and they were going out and pushing that four years ago to actually use and utilize their candidate database constantly they had to keep in contact with 200 candidates every single month so you can imagine the sort of capability that that brings you i can walk into a client the client says yeah i'd like to hire this type of person as it happens i've got three available let's video interview them now suddenly became a very different way of looking at recruitment it's all about the service to the client which sort of led to the next question is are our current candidate attraction methods old hat or do we need new methods or have new methodology to take to clients with you know, go to clients with rather than what we've got currently doing at the moment, right? Well, I, th- I think, you know, we all know we, we live in in what is essentially a network economy. The, the most successful consultants yep. get by and are successful because of the people that they know and the candidates they place. You know, they can build good relationships with the clients, as we saw from the online discussion we had a, a, a month or so ago about you know, what clients look for. And, and ultimately, it came down to relationship and being able to place good candidates. So flip that on its head and say, well, what makes a good consultant? Someone that is networked and knows the type of, com- type of skills that my client wants. And I know... 30, 40, 50 people. I know where they are. I know what they're doing. Um, and I may only have placed one or two of them. And that can be quite difficult if the reward structure in place is all about speed and placing people. Because we know that to make money as recruitment companies, we need to place um, candidates. But we also need to build into that as leaders something which rewards or certainly um, is positive for our consultants at the desk for building up that network 
almost like you said H, a few minutes ago about having three types of you know, passive active three types of um candidates and having a, a pot with 50 or 60 in each of them um now that, that's if you're working maybe in a niche area or you're in a, in a in one sector where the type of skills are similar if you are recruiting for all sorts of people from all sorts of different clients it becomes a bit more difficult but the, the, the more niche you can get, the, the more successful you can yeah. be anyway. Yeah. So I do think it's about networking. And that's, that won't surprise anybody, but it does when it comes to behaviour and reward. But it's connecting the dots. I think you're dots. right, Dave. Go I on, think Helen. you're right. Well, what I was going to say is Joe actually has put a comment um, in the chat as well that I think relates to that because the, that networking is with your clients and with your candidate. And what Joe's saying is that we that candidate care is and remains king and there are no shortcuts. And I think he's absolutely right. right. We need to be focusing our attention on that rare beast that is candidates and, and giving them a better service. So making our service focused around finding, keeping, placing candidates rather than looking for jobs because the jobs are just there right now, aren't they? Yeah. There's, a, yeah. there's a glut of jobs. Everything needs to be changed to be focused on candidates and candidate care. So just to throw in a point, and I'll, I'll use three words, process, process, and process. <laughs> so we what need, are you, a politician? We need processes. <laughs> God forbid I should be a politician. Mind you, could I be any worse? <laughs> let's not go there. We already had that conversation yeah, this morning. Let's, let's not go there, Paul. Yeah, um, moving, that moving, back back to, <laughs> moving back to a subject I do know something about, recruitment. I, 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 I levelling up. Yeah. <laughs> process, process and process. You know, if we're going to keep connected to our candidates, there have to be processes. You cannot leave it to the memories or the whims, as it were, of our consultants. There need to be processes in how often are we going to speak to them and what methods are we going to use to connect with them? You know, lots of the large corporations are now implementing or have implemented CTA, uh, candidate tracking systems, and uh, or as they have sometimes known um, applicant tracking systems. And um, it's very rare to find that in our recruitment businesses at this point, mainly I suspect because the software is very expensive um, and uh, probably unavailable to the smaller businesses, but the technology is going to improve, it's gonna get cheaper. We will all be looking at those, implementing those systems at some stage. In the meantime, what are we going to do to make sure there are routines in our business, disciplines in our business to ensure that candidates are consistently spoken to? And that isn't the, necessarily just the people we've seen in the last three, four weeks, but more importantly, to the points we've been making, how often we keep in contact with people that registered with us, as it were, six months, 12 months, 18 months, five years ago. How are we going to contact those guys? How do we keep their data fresh, clean? How do we know what they're up to? How do we understand when they're itching to find a new job and so forth? There's no way that's going to happen without process, process, process. So I think when we look at that type of thing, I remember sort of right at the beginning, we talked about it's not changing the habits, it's adding new habits. I remember a habit that I created when I was in a contract you know, position was I would know every single candidate when their end date was. And I'd be calling them two months before that and I'd be starting to talk about them when their end date was. I'm not talking about the candidates that were working for me because I'd be doing that naturally. I'm talking about all the other candidates that I had in my network because I wanted to know if their contract was finishing or if it was extending. Is there an opportunity there for me to go into the client or is it an opportunity for me to place that candidate and do it on that front? When we started to flip over and I started to manage permanent teams, when we started to have an issue where we couldn't find perm candidates for a role, what we started to look at was, let's look at the average tenure of a candidate in that position and then go search people. So let's say it was, the role had an average of two years tenure. We'd go search people in our database that registered on our database 18 months ago. And what we started to find then were candidates that maybe not updated their CV, but their skills were sort of almost 80, 90 percent there, but that had been missed out on a general skill search. Those candidates, we then started to place quite a few of those candidates because they'd been upskilled and they were now on that sort of exit period because that two year tenure average was starting to come up. So, yes, a lot of people went over that two years but what we found was some really good candidates in that way so we started to look at our database so even the database that we say are dead it's a bit dead that candidate hasn't been spoken for two years ago if you actually start to think about how you can use that and re 
vi revigorate that that data then all of a sudden you've got extra candidates that you can start to work with and that's what we're crying out at the moment is for extra candidates that we're trying to work with so even on a temp basis or a contract basis or a perm basis if you looked at your database and said right let's look at the candidates that we haven't spoken to for say for two years and we haven't had an updated cv for two years well what are they doing now could we use them? Because they'll be probably missed out on all your searches and they won't be there on your searches, but what are they doing now? Yes, quite a number will not be wanting a, the job that you have to offer, but quite a few will be. And in a candidate type marketplace, wherever you can find the candidates is the method. So the question is, is our database fit for purpose or do we need to update our databases now? And that's the thing we've been talking about for months and months and months, get your data in order. Is that something that now is not just something that is a nice to have? That is an absolute priority. It's a critical issue. It's a critical issue. You know, we have, there is, as we've just been discussing, there is not an expansive candidate market out there. You, you know, it's a revolving door. A lot of the candidates that we're interested in talking to have been around our revolving door already. And therefore, understanding who they are, where they are now is, is, is something that's critical. Now, by the way, this isn't as difficult as it used to be, is it? All you have to do is look on LinkedIn to establish whether the CV looks reasonably accurate. Uh, just about every candidate that we work with, or most candidates, are likely to be on LinkedIn. Not too difficult to figure out where they're working now um, and what they're doing now. Um, that would be relatively straightforward. I mean, just a point you make, Howard, I think is a great point. So, you know, out of 10 candidates that we speak to, how many do we get jobs for on average? What is it? Two out of 10? Three out of 10? Is it more than that? I doubt I'd it. I'd be surprised if it's I'd as be many very as surprised. It's as high as one out of 10. It, it, well, yeah. it's, it's a small number and everybody listening to this knows that. Does that mean that the other seven, eight people were rubbish? No, of course not. <clears throat> what about the guys that we set out, what we played, we put on interviews that for whatever reason didn't get the jobs? Are they rubbish candidates? Of course not. Uh, the people that we tried to place who found jobs of their own or found those jobs through competitors, have we forgotten those people? These are the majority of the candidates that come through our doors, as it were, every single day, every single year. Uh, the minority, the ones we place in jobs is another thorny question. At what point do you keep in, con do you keep in contact with those people you place that you made money from? And uh, what reasons do you have for contacting those people? You've alluded to this point, Howard. Um, how do you approach those guys? Because clearly, one would I would argue that it's probably immoral to be trying to pull them out of jobs you've made money out of filling. I think most people listening to this would, I'd hope, would see it the same way. But doesn't mean you can't keep in contact with them. Catch up calls. Hi, how are you? Um, and to your point, Howard, if their CVs consistently state that every two years they're looking for a new role. When would you be in touch with those guys? All of that data is there. We have it. it. We're sitting on it. And yet, what do we do? This is the beginning of this discussion. We get a job. We stick it on a job board. We put it on it. We put it out there. We spend more money on advertising roles instead of using the intelligence, in inverted commas, that we already have that we've paid for. We've paid for it. It's there. It's sitting there. Those candidates came into our database because we paid for it either we paid for advertising job boards or we paid our staff to find them but we've 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 put that information on our data and now we're going to pay all over again and all over again and all over again because it's just too much hassle to go looking into our database it's nonsense so what we're old... talking about again there paul is that change of habit yeah because if you think about when you search do a job search a candidate comes up on that job search and what's the first thing you do you look at their dates you look at their tenure you look at their skill set you look at what they're doing and you start to look at the tenure that they've had in jobs certainly on perm in contract maybe not as much certainly not as much in temp but you start to look at the durations that they've worked and you start to look at all of those things that you plot and then we go and try push the candidate forward to a client what we never do then is put that actual data onto the database properly so we can search that data and bring those candidates back as we've just discussed. But what we're also saying is that, you know, for you know, let's say we put four candidates across to a job and we place one of them, what do we do with the other three candidates? So the idea is not to have multiple candidates going in for one requirement. It's having 
multiple requirements being offered to a candidate and multiple opportunities and therefore it's having that opportunity to say to candidates this is what i've got to offer and putting them out to different uh, placements so you've got a candidate maybe with four interviews with four different clients and there so what anna's talking about when she says it's the, the education of the client needs to happen i think it absolutely does but i think the education of the consultant needs to be even more yep. because the value of that candidate is you know whatever your average fee is that's the value of the candidate so if you place four candidates as a one candidate out of the four, then times the average fee by three times, that's what you're missing out on. And if you could place just one of those or two of those, all Correct. of a sudden, how much does that increase that? And at this moment in time, when every client is crying out for skills, the fact that we're not recycling those candidates back into the recruitment process or introducing them to other clients, to me, is an absolute offence <laughs> to my intelligence as a recruiter because I'm not using the actual opportunities that I have sat there in front of me. They're, they're hangable, they're hangable, these people. We should hang them. <laughs> but Howard, to be fair, many, many of these very successful recruiters have learned to be very successful recruiters in a particular kind of market. Yes, true. And that market has changed. And sometimes we are so set on a set of behaviours that have always worked for us in the past that it's very difficult to, it's like a juggernaut, isn't it? It's very difficult to change direction. And yeah. I think that's where, as leaders uh, of organisations, we, uh, and many of the people on this call will have been leaders in different markets, where you can say, actually, guys, this has changed. The market's changed and you just need to change your focus. And sometimes, you know, human beings find change quite difficult and they just need a nudge to say, actually, it's a mindset change. Let's not focus on jobs anymore. Let's focus, focus on Candidates. Candidates, absolutely. Yeah, I, folks I, and candidates. I, I do think to, to Heather and, and Howard's point, there is an opportunity here, um, and Howard, you mentioned it, that actually we also need to be educating our clients that the, the candidates aren't where, you know, they're, they're, they're just not there in the propensity that most clients think they are. It's one of the biggest challenges that the companies I'm working with are facing. Their clients still think that if they come to them as an agency, they'll find the people with the same speed and efficiency, perhaps as they were doing a year ago or two years ago, even though everybody knows that it's a, a tough market because there aren't enough agency representatives pushing back on the client and saying, actually, we, we can't get them now, but this is what we can do. And this is what we're going to do for you. And having that really intelligent conversation to let them know that actually it really is a tough market for many, many candidates. And the really good candidates are gone almost straight away. Absolutely correct. Um, I, look, I don't think we're going to get into this right now because it's the wrong webinar, but we are in a classic supply and demand uh, marketplace, which also then comes back to the margins, your percentages. You know, if you're in a market where good candidates are, are in scarce supply, unless you're tied up with long-term low margin or low fee rates with clients why are you giving them away at cheaper rates so we'll come back to that another time if you've got a great candidate you should be trying to get better margins and i think this is all part and parcel of the same issue although we're not necessarily going to get into that right now dave just a point i wanted to add to something you said earlier about you know making sure that you're connected you know that six degrees of separation where we are all within six steps of connecting with anybody in the world and again this comes back to consultant training uh, howard produces brilliant boot camp training big big shout for howard and his training anyone has a signed up you fall sign up now um <laughs> can't pull, I, can't pull, can't. Uh, i'm just uh, i'm just gonna give it as it is howard let's say it as it is but i i do think that um this point about the sort of things that howard trains is around when you connect with somebody and you say to them it's the basics if you're not interested can you name two or three other people who might be interested or even saying that to clients when you're proposing a candidate so i think you know back to basics in those areas everybody's connected to other people each call that our consultants make can lead them to finding candidates much needed much sought after candidates if they just remember to ask a single simple sentence before they complete every conversation. But Paul, it, it is absolutely back to basics because many of our recruitment consultants haven't worked in a market like this before. And also 
where everybody's hiring. So we're going to hire people that actually don't really know recruitment. A lot of the consultants that are going to be joining our industry in the next year, whether they've got experience in business or not, they may not have recruitment experience. So the basics of what we learned, you know, 600 years ago, well, all of that actually comes to the fore today. Okay, there's new techniques, there's new software, there's yes, new technology, right. there's AI, there's all sorts of things like that, which yes, you right. see is, is there. But the basics, we have to really be sure we're teaching new people. My, my son is 20 and he's leaving his finance job to get a job in recruitment. He's become a candidate. And I am amazed, I won't say the companies he's applying for, I'm amazed that as a candidate, how he's being treated. I mean, it's it's so poor. And I look it's at it, if only, they, if only they got the basics right. Well, I mean, this is what Joe was saying a moment ago. Joe made a comment um, about, you know, the candidate is king or queen. And I think that's an entirely valid point. You know, look at world, look, look at producing world class service, customer service. Look at all the brands we admire outside of recruitment consistently they offer outstanding customer experience all of them without exception uh, we're a nation of moaners we love a moan the brits we love a good moan and bad news travels considerably faster than good news so you know you treat candidates poorly and it will circulate very very quickly dave you've just you didn't mention the names of those people but here you are doing exactly what i'm talking about your if your son's had bad experiences you're telling people about it and privately you probably do mention the names of those companies the truth is that bad news circulates much quicker than good news we have to make sure that we treat people with respect the candidates we meet today are the very same people that we'll be wanting to get business from in five ten years time so they let's also, move. The, sorry, let's, move on, let's, let's move. Let's move this on a little bit because there's some bigger questions to ask. So what we're talking about there actually is basic Darwinism, Darwinism, isn't it? It's not about the survival of the fittest or the strongest. It's about those that adapt. And if we don't adapt, then we won't survive. Yep. And it's about adapting now to the modern world and not using what we've done before and doing that. So if we look at that, say, let's look at how we attract and retain candidates then in the new era? So for me, the first thing, actually, before we move on to some of the other kind of things that we'll talk about around social media is actually putting the candidate at the center of your process. So it's actually looking at everything yeah. you do and every way in which you measure, reward uh, people in your organization. Is the candidate at the center of the process? Absolutely. That's a great. That's a great point. Yeah, is the candidate at the centre of the process? And I'd probably say nine times out of ten, no, it's not. Because yeah. getting the job on is king. But you can't fill the job and m make money out of that job unless you have a candidate. So therefore, why isn't candidate the king and the job the secondary? But we yeah. look at it always. I look at all KPI boards. It's all job, 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 job. It's not candidate, yeah. candidate, and candidate. And I think all of that has to change. I actually think you need to wipe it all out, start yes. again, and say, is every process focused around candidates. I completely agree with you. And by the way, you know, there is, as we were just alluding to this point a moment ago, they're not different human beings. It's the same person. You know, candidates and clients are the same person. And at certain points in their careers, they'll use us to help them find jobs and then they'll re-emerge as potential purchasers of our services. So, you know, when we talk about maybe treating clients better than we treat candidates, how foolish is that? Because that is the same individual, same human being. Our attitude to caring for candidates should be no different from the way in which we look after our clients. In fact, it should be the very same high, hopefully high standard. Um, then that, that I think, and this is where I think there is perhaps some pushback because you would probably argue that the people we help find work will speak highly of the service they've received. But as we've already talked about, they're in the minority in relation to the people we speak to. So how do you improve that experience for the people that we can't help, who we may be able to help in a year, two years, three years, or may become potential clients of ours. Because although we didn't get them jobs, although we didn't make money from placing them somewhere, their experience of working with us is at least as valid as anybody we placed in a job. I think it's, a, it's an interesting one where we put the candidate at the heart of the experience and what do they feel? And I think on all my courses, when we talk about candidates, I say one thing about candidates, candidates have big mouths. Mm -hmm. clients have big ears 
when a candidate has a bad experience, they will tell everybody on that client site and the client will hear about that. When they have a good experience, they tend to say very little. But what do clients tend to do constantly when a candidate walks on site, whether it be a temp contract or whether it perm, they tend to ask, what was your experience like with your recruitment agency? Because they are always looking for a better agency or a good agency to engage with. And they're always looking at how their candidates are treated. Because remember, we are their contact point for the client first and foremost into the marketplace. So how they are being represented is very important and even more so now. So I think that becomes a real interesting sort of uh, dilemma when we start to say spin it and put the candidate right at the heart of that uh, candidate attraction piece, how we treat them, not just when they have a job or we have an opportunity, when we haven't, what can we use them for? How can we keep in touch? And this goes back to using, rather than doing outward bound marketing onto LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, but doing internal, mar are we upset Dave? Um, doing mm -hmm. internal marketing onto your database of what's happening. So we send all this out to, client, to clients, we should be sending it to candidates as well because they're equally interested in what's yep. happening in the marketplace, irrespective yep. of their level. And if that could just push one placement a month to us, then that's more than you had before. Completely. And I think it's that type of thing, how we retain and attract candidates and how we keep them engaged is really important. I completely agree. By the way, I think Dave's gone to stick half a crown in the in the electric meter, so hopefully <laughs> he'll be back very soon <laughs> when the lights turn back on. Um, <laughs> I, I, I agree with you, Howard. I think, um, you know, this connection with candidates, I said it earlier, I, I, I wasn't joking, the processes around coding candidates, um, uh, timelines around contacting candidates, being very strict and rigid about this. This also, I think, talks to, and again, not lots of time today to discuss this, but we've banged on about the demise of the so-called 360 degree recruitment model over the years from a consultant perspective. I've said, and so have you guys for many years, we ought to have candidate care people in our business, people who do nothing else but connect and talk to candidates, either resourcing, uh, guiding them through interview processes, post-interview, post guiding them through notice periods, mentoring post-placement and so forth. I think that's a big role. I could sit down and write you a very, very uh, robust and I think compelling job description, if you ask me to do that, that would add real value to any business. So I think, again, this talks to what are we getting our people to do? Is it that they, is it the reason that they don't speak to candidates as frequently as we would like them to? Is that down to the fact they feel overwhelmed by the level of work we've given them? Do we need to segment that work? and look at how we attribute the work to different people in the organization. These are broad, these are broad questions, but it, it very much talks to the market we're in. Candidates are the kings and queens. How do we keep in touch? How have we got the resources to make sure that we do that? And I'm not talking about investing in very expensive software, as we said earlier, but I am looking at how you use your staff effectively. And, and I think there has been a tendency to think of that candidate care role in organizations as being maybe an entry level role or quite a junior role and so you know consultants don't want to do that part of the role because there's this perception of status associated with which i think is really wrong because i think actually that that okay. um the candidates are important and are king and that role of being able to mentor coach support control the candidates and their journey um throughout their careers actually that's a really important and should be a senior role so if you if we start to understand the candidate's worth and how to maximize that worth every time and how to monetize our database it becomes a very different concept doesn't it if you've got somebody that you're paying whatever you pay to for that sort of a candidate person to look after that that, that type of uh, that, that marketplace and look after the candidates that we're not placing if they could generate one or two placements a month they would be a good, strong, average biller. But what they're doing is they're finding candidates that you wouldn't normally find, and they'll be giving you candidates quicker. So it's understanding that worth of, of your database and understanding the worth of each individual job that you look at. So let's say each individual job, you speak to 10 candidates before you then, and that's your, your long list. And let's say the average fee is five grand. You know, that's pretty simple. 
that's a 50 grand revenue line that you've got there that's going to milk down to five grand if you only place one candidate from it. Hmm. So it's understanding that worth. And that goes back to then changing the habits of our consultants and changing the habits of the business. Because, you know, again, on the, on the courses, I'll, I'll say, you know, it, it, you go from candidate wonder, all your candidates are wonderful candidates, they're great. Your client calls in and goes, I want to offer this candidate A, all of a sudden B, C and D are candidate blunder. And they're absolutely the worst candidates ever. And all of a sudden, but hang on a minute, 30 seconds ago, they were brilliant and they were great. They were in for a job and now they're not. But just because they aren't one person's taste doesn't mean to say they're not somebody else's taste. So it's about utilizing that marketplace. So I think all agencies, they have enough candidates flow coming through their business at this moment in time they're just not utilizing it all. It might not be filling the jobs that you have, but it's not about filling the jobs that you have. It's about servicing the clients that you're working with and driving back into that client that might not have a job, but saying, here's a candidate that you haven't got, but they're on the market now. They're going to be gone quicker than a exactly. jump webinar. So you need to get off it and get <laughs> on with this candidate absolutely straight away. And that is a huge change in habit being proactive and as Paul would say, and as Anna said, when a candidate walks into your yeah. virtual office, either through a CV or into your office physically, can you place them by the end of that day or by the time they leave your office? Can you place that candidate? And I know when I was a contract consultant and the big boom market came in, you know, the millennium bug market, the millennium boom there for us was huge. And a candidate came in that we had, Boy, was he marketed out to, to clients. Boy, did we sell him in. We wouldn't let go until we sold him. Mm. And that is absolutely what should be had, happening now. 100%. We should understand our candidates' worth. So to me, it is about not changing the habits that we've got. It's adding new habits and creating better habits to maximize the worth of our candidate marketplace. Correct. 100% correct. correct. Obviously, we've, as always, we, 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 we like to run over. We're known for running over. I think it's become our, 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 our mantra. <laughs> mantra. It's 45 minutes, which actually means that's 35. It's like when you go to a fitness class and you go, guys, it's going to be nice and easy. We're going to have a nice, easy session. You know that you're going to walk out on your hands and knees with your tongue on the floor from that point of view. So what we're saying is then there is enough candidates in the marketplace to service our clients if we understand the how to access those candidates and m- utilize the candidates that are on our database. We understand that our database is might not be perfect, but the more we work on putting our candidates at the center of the recruitment process, the more our database will start to improve because if we start to update that data and can access that data, we'll be able to place more candidates. It's about recycling our candidates quicker and faster and understanding the flow of candidates coming in when they become available, but when do they next become available once we've placed them and how do we utilize that? It's about attracting and retaining candidates. And I think retaining the candidates is more important because we've already got them on our database. How do we become more in their mind's eye when they're looking for a job? And if we don't understand the worth of a candidate, then we do not understand the marketplace. And so I say it's about changing habits so it's not about changing the habits that we have. It's adding new habits to them. So next week, we're going to be looking at selling candidates to our clients. And next week, I think we're going to be releasing the DEI webinar series that will come out in July, which say we've got some really good speakers on that, some world-class speakers on that, in fact. Uh, so, yeah, look out for that and please sign up for that. If you've got any questions, please fire them to us. Thank you very much for joining us. It's always a pleasure. It's always a lovely Wednesday, and especially when the weather's shining and the, the windows are open, it's always nice to have a, a good audience to listen to and speak to. So enjoy the rest of your week, guys. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you all next week. Bye, everybody. Bye.